Well, in previous lectures, I've outlined a, a range of obvious contradictions between the real world and economic theory. And these contradictions in sciences have caused ultimately revolutions where the way scientists think about a particular area like physics, astronomy, chemistry, changes fundamentally. That doesn't happen in economics. And you may actually find, as I've given an example here, uh, economists ignore empirical research which contradicts their beliefs. Blinder being my favourite, and somebody pointed out the pun in his name recently. I thought that was quite good. Yes, he is, does want to be blind to what he sees. Um, uh, they even ignore their own research when it doesn't come out the way that they like. And they're willing to make absolutely crazy assumptions about the nature of capitalism, as if there's a benevolent central authority that everybody accepts the decisions of that authority to reallocate wealth before shopping takes place, and then we can have a downward sloping market demand curve. Crazy. Um, well, the essential problem, and I think the reason why this sort of nonsense comes up from economists to defend their prior beliefs, is that the vision neoclassical economics paints of capitalism is one of a perfect system. You have everybody getting what they deserve, so your pay rate is your marginal product. And I saw somebody pointing out uh, back during the global financial crisis that uh, the chief of groups like Morgan Stanley was saying, our workers are the most productive on the planet simply because we pay them a large amount of money, and that's taken as being their marginal product. Uh, it, it shows at the aggregate level and individual as well that you maximise your utility relative to the cost of production. So it's the best situation in terms of people, people's wants and needs being satisfied. And you get equilibrium and hey, that's got to be good, hasn't it? Better than disequilibrium. Uh, now what this does is it makes economists zealots for their vision of economics, not scientists who've got some dispassionate relationship with the area in which they study. Now, what that means is when they're faced with the conflict between reality and their beliefs, they stick with their beliefs. And funnily enough, I'm not going to say that the economists are special on their front because scientists behave the same way. And the reason that this happens in science but still leads to scientific progress is something that uh, Thomas Kuhn first investigated brilliantly in the structure of scientific revolutions. And if you haven't read it, read it. It's an incredibly important vision of how humanity has managed to progress, despite the fact that fundamentally humans are belief generating and belief sharing creatures uh, who want to maintain their beliefs and don't want to face any contradictions with them. But scientists get them all the time. And uh, Max Planck, uh, who led one of the greatest revolutions in physics ever, going from the eight ways of regarding energy as a wave and continuous to energy as being a wave-particle duality and discrete, uh, he solved an otherwise insoluble problem in physics where the predictions of the conventional Maxwellian model was that you'd have what was called the ultraviolet catastrophe. So as you get a higher and higher frequency of light, uh, you would get this infinite level of energy when in fact the predicted showed a peak and then a fall and an arbitrary measure of the level of radiation pressure. And Planck's theory, uh, Planck's model, fitted the data, whereas the conventional one didn't. But he couldn't convince a single one of his Maxwellian colleagues that this was therefore correct and their theory was wrong. So to get the full adoption of quantum mechanics and relativity and so on, you needed a whole new generation of students who could accept this new perspective on reality and replace their professors who could not accept that perspective. And you would have seen this summarised, as I've got in the heading there, as science advances one funeral at a time. The way Planck actually put it was to say, a new scientific truth is not tried by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. Disappointing, but real, realistic at the same time. Uh, now this, the way that Kuhn, uh, that Planck actually experienced his particular revolution and Kuhn's own analysis of the Copernican revolution with Galileo and so on overturning the vision of Earth as the center of the universe and uh, for, the, for the heliocentric vision that the sun was the center of our solar system. Kuhn formalized this whole process in a set of concepts he taught called normal science, paradigms, anomalies, and scientific, scientific revolutions. And normal science is where you have a previous achievement, and in the case of neoclassical economics, it's the 1870s development of marginalism, 
Uh, and given that foundation, people continue pushing what marginalism can do further and further and further, expanding its, founda its, its uh, applic application, uh, extending its foundations if they can, and so on. And that leads to a paradigm, and that's uh, a set of examples of how one should do science, uh, and that provides the models from which people continue doing that science. So Kuhn spoke about a paradigm being not just a way of viewing the world, but also a way of generating puzzles that can be given to students to solve the puzzles, and as you solve the puzzles, the paradigm grows. But the breakdown comes when you make equipment designed specifically to support and confirm the normal science, and it fails to do so. You get a prediction from the equipment or from the, uh, the, the mathematical model in the case of the Maxwellian theory that gave us the ultraviolet catastrophe, which didn't happen. Um, you, you just find that you, you cannot fit this new phenomenon into the old paradigm. And then a science a revolution comes along, Planck's being, I think, the, the best example ever, uh, which completely uh, changes how people think about the physical world. So we go from the certainty of the Maxwellian vision and the separation of matter and energy to the uncertainty of the quantum mechanical vision and the melding of matter and reality and theories of relativity and so on. Um, now, this has happened in science and it's been Planck's experience and Galileo's before him and a whole range of revolutionary thinkers who led to new ways of thinking about physics. They never converted their followers. Instead, you had a process that the believers in the old paradigm couldn't prevent that meant the change occurred. So the reason you can't prevent these in a real science is that when you attempt to resolve the anomaly using normal science, you fail in some way. So some people would try to fit the other side of that actual humped distribution of energy and get a low frequency a catastrophe rather than a high frequency catastrophe. And then you meld the two, but you've got a hodgepodge of a theory, et cetera, et cetera. So the people in the, within the normal science continue trying to resolve the anomaly within that paradigm and continue failing. Uh, now, the trouble is the anomaly doesn't go away and students, certainly in the olden days, before we got to the stage, we had to build a particle accelerator to uh, distinguish different theories, the anomaly can be reproduced by students as well. So they can say, here's this anomaly, your theory can't explain it. Uh, so the students won't accept a paradigm that can't resolve the anomaly. And it might be taught by lecturers who believe in the Maxwellian vision, but all the time at the back of the brain they've got, this doesn't explain the black body radiation problem, Planck's solution does, etc, etc. Now eventually, those old adherents of the old paradigm must eventually retire or die. And when they go, they've got to be replaced. And when they're replaced, the only uh, students who finish the whole degree and be able to go, go further are those who are committed to resolving the anomaly and generating a new paradigm. And that therefore causes a new paradigm to come about. It replaces the old and you have a new science. Now, why have I highlighted different phrases there? It's because those conditions don't apply in economics. Anomalies in economics are either transient events, things like uh, the Great Depression, uh, which was followed by World War II, which meant your focus went from solving the unemployment of the Great Depression to harnessing the resources for fighting World War II. Then you had the Golden Age, then we had stagflation, we had the Great Recession followed by COVID, now it's going to be followed by climate change and impacting on the economy, etc., etc. The crises in economics are a moving target. Or well, they're logical disputes which can be forgotten. So if we go back to the 1920s, there was a interesting engagement between different perspectives uh, in economics about the shape of the cost curve. Schraffer should have won that argument, but nobody apart from rebels like myself remembers or reads Schraffer's papers. You have the interpretations of Keynes, Keynes coming out with an interpretation dominated by uncertainty, Hicks bringing in uh, the interest rate as the regulating factor. Uh, realising it was wrong and publishing a retraction in 81, but none of the mainstream ever reads that. Uh, you have the empirical contradiction of rising marginal cost, which I focused on in an earlier lecture, and, uh, and that's ignored, and with, as I'll show later in this lecture, Friedman actually put forward a methodology specifically focused on saying, don't read that empirical data. 
the 60s, we have the Cambridge controversies, Schraffer's magisterial and incredibly short and very hard to read, uh, the uh, production of commodities by means of commodities, ultimately Samuelson conceding defeat and saying, yes, the, the critics are right, the mainstream is wrong. Uh, but what we hear about it today, the Sonnenschein mantle de Burr theorem, which reproduces what came out of uh, Gorman and, um, and Samuelson, but not with the same stupid twists. Central banks reject loanable funds in 2014, and what do we get in 2022? They get the Nobel Prize to Bernanke for a loanable funds view of how banks operate. So funerals aren't enough in economics, we need more. And of course we can't forget the ideological role of economics as well. Now there's an obvious uh, role to that which most people focus upon, and that if you have a pro-capitalist and an anti-capitalist theory, the anti-capitalist theory is unlikely to get uh, uh, you know, grants from research groups, um, it's not going to get benevolent trusts, etc., etc. So you get more funding for the pro-capitalist theory than anti-capitalist theory. The less obvious, but I think actually more important point, is that the paradigm itself has an enormous ideological appeal to its adherents. And I'll give a personal anecdote here. Uh, I broke away when I was 18 years old, so I've well and truly left behind this vision, but I remember believing in the paradigm of neoclassical economics in my uh, 16 and 17 year old as fervently as any of the modern believers do today. And I ended up organising seminars between unions and management in Australia under what was called the Accord. And as part of that, we had a meeting with uh, the food industry between food manufacturers and food unions and a member of the Industries Assistance Commission, which is now called the Productivity Commission, came along to explain the tariffs that were set on food. And he was attacked by the, both the management and by the unions, and I knew he was going to be attacked. Anyway, we held at the conference at an isolated venue, and he was sitting by himself in the bar. Nobody was talking to him. So I went down and had a, a chat to him. And after a while, he finally said to me, look, you're an economist. Help me convert these people. Convert. Okay. It's religious. The neoclassicals aren't a war of it, but it's religious. It's a vision of a system as capitalism is, as ideal. There's no power concentrations. Everybody gets their just reward. And equilibrium, what a great place to be. Um, but then on the other extreme, when you get the break into different schools of thought, Marxists are, uh, forever come back to seeing capitalism as exploitative and socialism is the ideal. So you get these locked in perspectives and the neoclassical definitely dominates economics, which means the generational change doesn't occur. You forget the anomalies. The old paradigm, uh, adherence to the old paradigm can find new recruits for it because it's a seductive vision of a perfectly functioning system. So the revolution doesn't take place and therefore economics is not a science. We can't cleanse it of bad beliefs and in fact, a non-scientific methodology has come along to defend what economics do, coming from Milton Friedman uh, with the argument assumptions don't matter, from a paper called The Methodology of Positive Economics, published in the year I was born, 1953. And what he argues here is that the truly important and significant hypotheses will have assumptions that are wildly inaccurate descriptions of reality, and here's the punchline, and in general, the more significant the theory, the more unrealistic the assumptions. And he says, well, it's because an assumption theory is, is hypothesis is powerful if it explains much with very little. So it leaves all the unimportant stuff out, just focuses upon the important stuff. So therefore, the hypothesis has to be descriptively uh, false. And you said you can't uh, evaluate a theory on the basis of whether it's assumptions or realistic or not. You can just say whether the theory gives good predictions, and that's the only way you can decide between it. And if you get involved in a fight with a neoclassical economist over methodology, this is where they're going to end up. Now, it's bad methodology, and there's a beautiful paper by Alan Musgrove, the philosopher Alan Musgrove, uh, which I have in my references for this talk. And he said, what's going on here is that Friedman is confusing negligibility assumptions. So for example, when you're modeling dropping lead balls from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you can assume that air resistance is negligible. So you can leave that out, even though there is air resistance. Uh, but of course, there's the other side is, what if you tried dropping those balls from a hot air balloon, you know, 20,000 meters above 
the, above Italy. Uh, if you drop it from that height, well, the air resistance is going to mean those objects reach terminal velocity, and therefore the resistance characteristics predominate the gravitational side of the whole theory. So your domain assumption is on dropping this close enough to the ground that air resistance won't matter. Uh, and there's other type of assumption, and this is one of my, my favorite examples, heuristic, where you make an assumption that you know is false, develop an analysis based upon it, and then remove that assumption and see what happens. And this is how Einstein explained special relativity. He wrote down a, a rule saying how, what happens when you add velocities together in classical mechanics. Of course, if you do that, you can get a speed faster than the speed of light. But he says that doesn't hold in reality. We'll, we'll assume it's correct now and then show how we can modify it to get an accurate theory. So we have negligibility assumptions, where what Friedman is saying is not insanely stupid and domain assumptions and heuristic assumptions where what he is saying is insanely stupid. But economists use Friedman's, they, they say, let's just think as if firms do this, as if this happens, as if. But in fact, they're not as if assumptions, they're as isn't assumptions. So for example, get back to the example of uh, the theory of rising marginal cost. When you go and do the empirical research, and this is why Blinder is such a classic example of the neoclassical disease, you find that, in fact, what you think is the simplifying assumption doesn't apply at all in reality or applies to only a tiny minority. So between 89 and 95 percent of firms said they had falling marginal cost. Now, what was the reaction to this? Friedman actually wrote his paper specifically to tell the readers, don't bother reading this empirical literature. So in, this is the paper he says, if you ask a billiard player, how does he sink the ball? He'll say, just figure it out, or I rub it with Brevet's foot just to make sure. The businessman may well say he prices at average cost with some minor deviations when the market makes it necessary. Sidestepping the issue that was found in all these studies, that it wasn't saying it's how he set the price. They were being asked about what happens to your costs over time. And they said the variable costs, as well as the average fixed cost, per unit fall. So, you know, bait and switch. Um, and he said the, the one statement is about as helpful as the other. Neither is a relevant test of the associated hypothesis. Let's just pretend firms act as if they're equating marginal cost to marginal revenue. But in fact, the preconditions for that to work didn't exist. So Friedman didn't want economists to read these papers because they contradicted the assumption of rising marginal cost over a I think something in the order of 100 studies, I might have that wrong. Uh, they all find marginal cost is constant or falling, uh, but they're, they're ignored. Only characters like me know of the papers and read them. So Milton Friedman's defense of the religion worked, the papers weren't read, and then as a side effect of having this methodological con con shared belief, which sort of became part of the neoclassical hardcore, um, crazy assumptions became domain. And these are domain assumptions. Um, so Galileo's proof that a, a heavy body falls at the same rate only works if you have, um, you know, you're you close to the air. Well, let's say you decide, okay, let's prove it by evacuating all the air about an leading tower of Pisa. Would have made a trivial impact on the experiment. So that's what a simplifying assumption is about. But this, this is applied to assumptions where if the assumption is false, then so is the theory. So another example from the earlier lecture, if you assume banks are intermediaries, then there's no role for credit in aggregate demand. And this was the argument that I elaborated on when I showed where Bernanke was wrong about what caused the Great Depression and the Great Recession as well. So if there's loanable funds, then credit does not add to aggregate demand and therefore uh, redistributing uh, rate changing levels of private debt will have no significant effect upon the macro economy. But when you look at the data, you find it strongly rejects that assumption. This is the, the, in the 19, uh, 1920s to 40s where the correlation of change in private debt and unemployment was minus 0.81. Come forward to when Bernanke's chairing the Federal Reserve, correlation minus 0.82 over the 30 years between 1990 and 2020 overwhelmingly showing that his assumption is wrong. It's a domain assumption. It's false. If banks were intermediaries, then credit would not matter. Since they are not, then credit does matter. And who did they give the Nobel Prize to? So domain assumptions matter. Uh, but because of this, you know, you can't judge a theory by its uh, assumptions mantra.
uh, and particularly that only applies when the research is confirming neoclassical beliefs. Then, then they'll say, oh, you know, uh, if, if you if, if you make an assumption that contradicts their beliefs, they'll reject you on the basis of the assumption. If you make an assumption which confirms their beliefs, they'll pass you for publication. So what we get is absurd assumptions being made to jump over fundamental logical flaws. Now these are three assumptions by Nobel Prize winners, okay? uh, and not including Nordhaus. I'll get to him in a moment. So Samuelson uh, about how you can drive a downward sloping demand curve. If optimal reallocations of income can be assumed to keep the ethical worth of each person's marginal dollar equal to get downward sloping market demand curves. Uh, Sharp, who gave us the efficient markets hypothesis, investors are assumed to agree on the prospects of various investments. So nobody debates the returns of shares because A, we all have agree exactly the same future returns. We don't, nobody thinks IBM is going to get a different amount to what somebody else thinks IBM is going to get. And we're all right as well. We're all correct. That's the basis of the efficient markets hypothesis. And here is probably, the, I think, the craziest of the lot. Uh, de Brewer's theory of value. And when in talking about production, he says he actually has the idea that all, all exchange happens at one point in time and then those prices apply for the infinite future. And the certainty assumption implies that a producer knows what input-output combinations will be possible in the future. You give Nobel Prizes to these guys? So again, these bizarre assumptions were sometimes explicitly justified by pointing back to Friedman's methodology. That certainly applied with Sharp. So we have a failure to undergo scientific revolutions. Uh, and the, the, let's have a, a look at one of the examples. If you look back at pre-relativity uh, physics, it assumed there had to be some medium in space to enable light to travel through space. And the Mishras and Morley experiment trying to measure uh, the impact of that assumed substance on the speed of light found there was no difference. So it's a fundamental anomaly. Now relativity and quantum mechanics explain how light can travel through a vacuum. But the pre-relativity science couldn't accept that. They continued teaching the old one, but the students knew the anomalies. They could actually do the experiments themselves, only accept the ones where, there's a, uh, where a theory actually explains it. And this theory involves a paradigm shift. You go from regarding Time, uh, energy is continuous to energy is particulate and discrete. So eventually the old scientists retire, the new students come along who are committed to the new paradigm and replace them, so science advances one funeral at a time. So it's a punctuated process. An established paradigm hits a fundamental anomaly, established scientists resist it, the students can't be persuaded to ignore the anomaly, a new paradigm explains it, the old scientists die, students take their place, paradigm change occurs. That doesn't happen in economics. Uh, you go through these crises, but then they're not re repeated once more. You have theoretical problems, but you gloss over them. Uh, it's like Samuelson even concedes defeat in the capital controversy, saying, as I quoted earlier, um, if this all calls, causes headaches for those nostalgic for the old time parables of neoclassical writing, we must remind ourselves that scholars are not born to live an easy existence. We must respect and appraise the facts of life. Great. Does he change his textbooks? No. His textbook still teaches the marginal product theory of income distribution as if it's never been challenged. And most of the graduates of those courses, including people like Paul Krugman, believe that the neoclassicals won that fight when they lost it. Okay? So, and also the existing adherents want to ignore the anomaly. Again, because the anomaly points out the system isn't as perfect as they think it actually is. Now, you, of course, in the middle of all this, you have some students who forget, refuse to forget the anomalies. So Hyman Minsky put it, I think, probably better than anybody, uh, is explaining where his approach to economics came from. His question that he posed was, can it, a Great Depression, happen again? And if it can happen, why didn't it occur in the years since World War II? He was writing in 1980 the 1980s when he wrote this line. These are questions which flow from both the historical record and the comparative success of the past 35 years, from 1945 to 1980. To answer these questions, it is necessary to have an economic theory which makes Great Depressions one of the possible states in which our type of capitalist economy can find itself. Is neoclassical economics that theory? Absolutely not. 
So what happens is a rival paradigm forms around this insight from somebody as, as brilliant and innovative a thinker as, as, uh, as Hyman Minsky, but you remain marginalised. You get low-quality uh, low positions, low-quality universities, uh, you, you talk amongst yourselves, but you don't get listened to by the mainstream. So you have a pretty scientific uh, discipline but because the old paradigm can continue finding uh, new believers in this meritocratic vision of how society would function. I actually see it as a, a utopian anarchist interpretation of capitalism. That's what it fundamentally is. And there's something very appealing about the idea of a system with no power, which is what the an word anarchy means. Now students get sucked into this vision and they get all sorts of puzzles they can solve too with the mathematics based on it. The old paradigm carries on, it ignores the anomalies. Critics form a, a heterodox school. So these are some of my favorite critics, including Hayek, by the way, uh, not for his math, uh, his, more for his vision about the limits of, math, of, of economics um, and also the role of uncertainty uh, than a lot of the other stuff that people like him for. And these become minority schools of thought. They're poorly funded, but they still exist. They end up in low-ranked universities. And I went from U University of New South Wales, or University of Sydney, the University of New South Wales, the University of Western Sydney, the Kingston University. And as my status went up, the universities I got a job in went down. Uh, or you get a job in business and marketing schools where a certain level of realism is appreciated by the staff coming from accounting and management and so on. And they therefore appoint people who aren't quite as deluded as the mainstream. And that's where a lot of not lefty uh, economists end up working and finance sector think tanks and that sort of thing. So economics continues on without a revolution. For that reason, it's not a science. And as I actually call this tendency to make absurd assumptions to overcome logical conundrums or empirical irregularities, the neoclassical disease. And you might know the joke about, let's assume there's a can opener. I don't know if I've told it, so I, I might be repeating myself here, but I actually was heard, I first heard it being told by a physicist uh, because I, uh, um, I was living in the southern suburbs of Sydney and the universities of New South Wales and Sydney were competing over student entrance even back then. And they arranged a, a uh, talk by uh, Professor Philip Baxter, who was a, a nuclear physicist and ran the University of New South Wales, and the professor from my department at Sydney University, uh, Simpkin. And myself and a few other students went along to make life a bit difficult for them. And Sim uh, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh. <laughs> Colin Simkin, Colin Simkin. Colin gave a vision, a typical neoclassical vision of the how society should be reorganized. So lots of small firms, competitive industries, et cetera, et cetera. And Baxter was literally at one stage said, you can have any car you like, so long as it's white, uh, as one of his lines. So mass production, single producer, et cetera, et cetera. And I asked a question contra contrasting the two views. And Simkin took advantage to abuse me for being in the room about maybe a thousand people present. And I pointed out that I was a resident of the St. George and Sutherland Shire, so quite entitled to be there. Uh, Baxter agreed with my question, juxtaposing his monopoly, uh, large scale industrial planning view against uh, the dis uh, dis uh, dispersed vision that, uh, that Simkin had. And he simply hopped up and told this joke. And he said, there's a physicist, a chemist, and an economist who get wrecked on a desert island and a container load of, of uh, baked beans washes up with them. And the physicist says, well, if we gather those fronds over there and get the sun right, I can, I can work out an, an angle to get the temperature that the fronds will ignite, and we can then cook the, 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 the baked beans, and the cans will ultimately explode. Um, although that's the chemist who said that. And then the physicist said, well, if you do that, I can calculate the trajectory of the beans so we can work out where to gather them. And the economist says, oh, guys, you're doing it the hard way. Let's assume we have a can opener. So bad methodology leads to bad theory. And the bad methodology, uh, the, the bad foundation of modern economics is this idea you must have a micro-founded theory. And this is actually uh, what you can call not reductionism, which is the way that sciences took a complicated problem, broke it down in small components to attempt to understand it. This is saying, we've got the small components, let's build the macro from the micro. And if you look at Lucas 
uh, in the essay that led to the so-called Lucas critique. Uh, this essay has been devoted to a single syllogism. The structure of an econometric model consists of the optimal decision rules of economic agents. So we've got to get down to the minds of, near, of individual utility maximizing agents. That's got to be the basis of macro. And now speaking some time later, uh, when he'd become the president of the American Economic Association. He said, the theory has to be microeconomically founded. Nobody was satisfied with RSLM. The idea was we were going to tie it, i.e. macro, together with ma micro, and that was the job of our generation. Now, uh, writing before either of these events, the genuine Nobel Prize winner, uh, Philip Anderson, argued in a beautiful paper called More is Different, that you could array the sciences in a hierarchy according to the idea that the elementary ideas of science X obey the laws of science Y. So you get a table like this and you can say that chemistry has to obey many particle physics and molecular biology has to obey chemistry, etc., etc. You said you can do that, but that doesn't mean that you can start from those laws and reconstruct the universe. It's that at each level of complexity, new properties appear the understanding of which requires research which is as fundamental in its nature as any other. And he finished with the line, psychology is not applied biology, nor is biology applied chemistry, and macroeconomics is not applied micro. Now, if you could do it, then this would be the same thing sciences do. So, you know, it would be the case that fluid uh, dynamicists would derive the property of water, which is the macro uh, element from the property of the micro, which is a molecule of H2O. So here's a, a water molecule. Um, yeah, okay. And then you'd have an ice molecule, a steam molecule, a snowflake molecule. Now, that is nonsense. It's actually the emergent properties of water that give us these different states. And you can't understand uh, those emergent properties without considering the relationship between different uh, entities, even when they're identical. Identical molecules of H2O are what give you the various forms of a concentration of H2O and our amalgam. So what happens at the aggregate level is very different to what happens at the micro level. So micro foundations is a non sequitur. Now, we have to defeat this paradigm. It is a threat to the existence of life on Earth frankly. Uh, but to get rid of it, criticism alone isn't enough and nor alternative models. We need a new foundation and some of the elements of that has to be based on thermodynamics. We're exploiting free energy to maintain the society in which we live. We necessarily generate waste. We necessarily degrade the ecology. They're not externalities. We're doing it in our own backyard. That's an essential part of the vision. We need a, a theory of value that uh, enables us to have levels where subjective and objective uh, valuations change ranking against each other. And I, uh, when I, since I gave these lectures uh, to get the, pri the prize in Trier, which is Marx's old hometown, I reformatted uh, my uh, master's thesis on Marx, showing that his own philosophy contradicts the labor theory of value and could be a foundation for a realistic economics. So if you want to check that out, follow that link. Uh, you would have macroeconomics derived directly from macroeconomic definitions. And I explained in one of the, the workshops, uh, the workshop on Goodwin's model, that you can derive Goodwin's model from strictly true macroeconomic definitions. So what you get out of this is that the structure of the economy actually determines its behavior, far more so than the the decisions of individual agents within that. And what you get is a complex system of visions. You have a monetary far from equilibrium dynamics in the economy. And that's why I also designed Minsky to enable this sort of modeling to be done easily by economists and to be shared. And microeconomics should become the study of evolutionary change, the stuff that Schumpeter spoke about, the stuff that Marshall fantasized about, but didn't put in his footnotes. And his footnotes became uh, conventional micro. We just need to throw that out. Uh, but my closing fear is that we may get this done too late, and particularly the delusions that economists accept have enabled them to accept delusions about climate change. Because they are so wrong, climate change may end up destroying capitalism long before we build an alternative theory of capitalism itself. 
this is when, this is when I saw this, I was just couldn't believe it. But this only a bunch of neoclassical referees could pass an assumption like this. Three percent of national output is produced in highly sensitive sectors, and about eighty-seven percent in sectors that are negligibly affected by climate change. So you thought all of manufacturing, all of services, wholesale and retail, all of government, all of finance would be unaffected by climate change because it happens indoors. Uh, toll, and this is the first time, the very first time I just realised how insanely stupid this work was, said that they assume that the variation of economic activity over space, so the relationship between temperature and GDP around the world and inside a particular economy, uh, you can use that to predict the impact of climate change. No, you can't. It's your nonsense. And I go through in detail why that's the case. So what we're going to have, and I think we're starting to see it even in, in this, this particular decade, we're going to get real world calamities that occur far sooner and are far larger than the fantasies of economists said they would be. They could quite possibly mean the destruction of the sedentary agriculture on which our civilization is based by droughts and fires and floods. We'll have energy crises like we're going right now, and the human response will be, even though we know that the, the climate crisis has been caused by too much CO2, we'll pump up uh, production of CO2-based energy when we face the choice of using less energy to make, have an, a sustainable ecology. So I expect our carbon dioxide performance to get worse with time, not better. Uh, and therefore, we might find that economics fails to have a scientific re revolution until after capitalism no longer exists. And I remember reading this comment from John Blatt back in uh, the late, late 1980s when I first read his book. And I thought it was a, a great piece of hyperbole, but it may indeed become true. Indeed, some may think that capitalism as a social system may disappear before its dynamics are understood by economists. Now, next, uh, I'll finish this, it's not quite the end. I'm gonna do a quick workshop uh, in a couple of days after I get a new version of the software I'm designing uh, for data analysis based on Minsky. So that'll be the end of it. So I hope you've enjoyed the lectures so far.